look, let's be honest. I said I was going to uh, release a document, and um, clearly we haven't. Okay, April Fools. April Fools. Uh oh. Um, the big reveal. Imagine that that Taurus that you see in the lower left corner of the screen, mm -hmm. okay? Yep. Is a two dimensional model, toy model of space time. So yep. going around through the center is like Groundhog Day. You come back to the same place and it's a repeating time cycle. And space is simply a circle. Now, in such a world, we would normally think of quantum field theory or gravity as taking place on that object. And you'd have fields, you'd have effectively functions called sections on that object. And what you're seeing here is something that's very hard to picture because it's five dimensional. But one, one trick here is because the torus has a property called parallelizability, the object on the right is a um, depiction of a metric, each point that isn't on one of those two sheets is a potential metric at any given point on the torus. So in other words, if a metric is a symmetric non-degenerate two tensor, if you think of it as a matrix, it would be of the form X, Z, Z, Y. And the non-degenerate means that X, Y minus Z squared is not equal to zero. So that's what's cutting out that variety, if you will, the zeros of the, de of the determinant uh, would be points given that there are three degrees of freedom in the metric. And so instead of actually having a metric uh, space time, GU would say replace the torus by the entire space in that sort of hourglassy region. So the top region would be like space space metrics. Mm -hmm. The bottom region below that sort of weird uh, diaphanous scarf is time time metrics and the weird middle region um, which is sort of uh, around that singularity would be space time metrics every way you can stick that donut into that middle region without touching one of those two sheets is a valid space time metric and what GU would do is to say don't only dance on the points of the two-dimensional torus Again, the surface is two-dimensional, even though it seems to be three-dimensional to naive uh, investigation. You should actually have fields that are dancing on all of the points of the torus and simultaneously all of the points in that middle region mm. of the, uh, what we call the Diablo diagram. No, to, to the right, to the right, yep. So every point in that region is in play and if you mapped, imagine that the stuff in that weird um, hourglassy region on the far right was like very warm and on the far left was very cold. Then if you map the torus into the far left region, it would be, it would show up as being cold. If you mapped it into the far right region, you'd, you'd see it as being very hot. So every way of mapping the torus in pulls back different information from that hourglassy region. And that is in large measure in part, uh, one of the things that may be going on with the illusion of many worlds is, is that what you're seeing is, is that the metric may be capable of pulling back data that is dancing on the space of all metrics as well as the space of all points on the original manifold X. So in this case, you've got two, two degrees of freedom on the torus. You've got three degrees of freedom around the hourglass. And two plus three equals five. Now notice that thing up in the top left, which is a ruler protractor combination that I just uh, gave a copy to, to Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. those two sliders are recalibrations of what it means to be one unit. And that protractor is a recalibration of what you're going to define to be 90 degrees. So every way of keeping that bottom arm in a single uh, horizontal position, moving the top arm and moving the two sliders, that's one of that's three degrees of freedom in the space of metrics. So that's a different depiction of the space of metrics. So the, the big take home from the 
restrictive version of GU that we're exploring here is that if you allow fields to dance on the space of metric apparatus, measurement apparatus, then it, the kind of the paradoxes of measurement start to make a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. You could also potentially try to keep the metric classical because we have two spaces. We have a space downstairs X, which is just the torus, and we have a space upstairs, which is the torus, in this case, cross the hourglass region, as long as it doesn't touch the two sheets. Mm. So you've got a five-dimensional manifold hovering over a two-dimensional manifold, and fields on the five-dimensional manifold will be perceived on the two-dimensional manifold when you pull them back via a particular Einsteinian space-time as fields on the tangent bundle of what you will call space-time together with fields on the normal bundle inside of the five dimensions. So the normal bundle of a two-dimensional manifold in a five-dimensional space is three-dimensional. Yeah. So you're going to see fields that look like, let's say, spinners on two dimensions, tensor spinners on three dimensions. If you were in four dimensions, make that torus in your mind represent a four-dimensional space-time, then that Diablo, Diablo region would be a 10-dimensional region of metrics, right? Because uh, four by four matrices that are symmetric have four squared plus four divided by two used for different degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. In other words, you get a 10-dimensional normal bundle. Now you'll notice that if you have ordinary spinners on 14-dimensional space and you pull them back via a metric, which is a mapping of four into 14, it looks like spinners on the four-dimensional space, tensor spinners on the ten-dimensional normal bundle. If the normal bundle inherits the Frobenius metric from X13, and you glue in the trace piece in the right way, you either well, if you glue it, glue it in the wrong way, you'd get a 7-3 metric on the normal bundle. But if you glue it in the right way, you'd get a 6-4 metric on the normal bundle. And 6, 4, spin 6, comma 4 is a sort of nasty non-compact group. So you might want to break to its maximal compact subgroup like uh, Witten and uh, Barnaton discuss. And the interesting thing about spin 6, comma spin 4 is that it has different names. By low dimensional isomorphism, spin 6 is the same thing as SU4. And spin 4 is the same thing as SU2 cross SU2. And spin and SU4 cross SU2 cross SU2 is the Petit Salam theory. Mm -hmm. So you can argue that ordinary spinners on the induced metric in 14 dimensions, glued in the right way, pull back as Petit Salam. And I don't know if anyone's ever discussed the connection between Einstein and Petit and Salam. No. no. Well, no, I, I can't say no. I don't know. Of it. I don't know. Um, that's what I'm saying. People have brought it up, but yes, ha have it has it ever? Has anyone? Been? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. But so the point this is, is that spinners on fourteen look like spinners on four tensor spinners on some version of ten. Yeah. And whether you're talking about spin ten models, SU five models, or SU four cross SU two cross SU two, which is spin six cross spin four, isn't that exactly what we see in the standard model? Mm -hmm. Very so Frank Wilczek, let me just uh, see if I can find this beautiful quote from him because he he definitely um, brought this up. And what I recently did when I had him on my podcast, which we haven't released, so if we go over to my screen share, yeah, uh, give me one second. Let me do this. Here we go. And so there we go. Yep. Let me read it. A particularly intriguing feature of SO10, which is really spin 10, or could be spin 6, comma spin 4, is its spinner representation used to house the quarks and leptons in which the states have a simple representation in terms of basis states labeled by a set of plus and minus signs. Perhaps this suggests composite structure. Now here's the sentence that just floored me. Alternatively, one could wonder whether the occurrence of spinners both in internal space and in space-time is more than a coincidence. And then he pulls back immediately 
These are just intriguing facts. They are not presently incorporated in any compelling theoretical framework as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Geometric unity is that compelling framework. And one of the things I'm looking to do is I'm looking to get constructive feedback from people who want to help me succeed as opposed to people who just want to be dicks. And what I would love is to bring your positive energy. Go to, go to geometricunity.org.